Okay, friends and neighbors, I told you all a couple days ago we were going to do a amp build, so let's do an amp build. Um, somebody guessed, based on looking at our cabinet here, that this was a Ted Weber kit, which it is, but it's not a Vox. It's uh, one of his original designs called a Natalie, and this kit, this uh, kit's uh, cabinet is more martially in shape and whatever. Um, interesting amp uses four 6V6s, three 12AX7s, and I'm curious what it sounds like. So before I start putting components on our eyelet board, I'm going to see how our eyelet board fits. And the way the screw holes are, are we have you know four there that would mount our board. If I were to put it in this way, which would be the dull side up, it would end up sticking down here, sort of covering up the power tubes, which are deeper and taller, so logic dictates it would be here, like that, and there will be standoff, so it should stand up about an inch and give some clearance for the preamp tubes and that kind of thing, so I'm going with that as the way it was intended to be installed, plus the eyelets are a little bit bigger and easier to solder on this side. Okay, so I've got my bags of capacitors and resistors for starters. And I've got my board laid down here. And I figure I'll probably just start from uh, left to right here. And there are a number of traces and hookups underneath the board. I did make that bigger, the layout diagram. I did print it out bigger so it's easier for me to see. And I'm going to start with this little quadrant over here. Okay, kids, so we'll call this part one of making our circuit board. Um, if you order one of these kits, the parts you get might look a little different than what I've got. But uh, we've got the 800 and, or 180 kilo ohm 1 watt resistor over there. That's the gray one. Then we've got a 2525 microfarad uh, capacitor with an 8.2K, 1 watt. That would be this business here. And then we have our 100 microfarad, 450 volt super power caps there. And you can see in the diagram they have the 220K resistors jumping them. They were drawn on top, but obviously they fit better underneath. Now, by default, I would have thought to put this resistor on this side, but it turns out the screw for the mounting would be obscured. So I just put that post in right now for starters and tucked in the um, resistors in the middle there. And that's uh, fine. Obviously, the farther, if I could get the resistor farther out, for cooling, that might be better, but you know, you have this base that you have. So, cool. So that's what we got so far, and then if you look on your diagram, you'll see some connections there, where like these two are tied at the bottom, and then these two are tied over here. You'll see the various ties there, the, the linkages uh, indicated by the dots, um, the dotted lines, and those have been created either using the leads from the components or with a piece of wire if it was longer than a component lead could go. So now I'll move on to the next phase I suppose. Okay so we'll call this phase two. We've got our 40 microfarad capacitors and our 10k resistors and then we've got our 150 uh, microfarad capacitor for the bias which is installed backwards. Um, I might have forgot to mention in phase one, these are uh, the plus and minus are flipped. These are series together. Just make sure you double check that on your diagram. But uh, we're looking pretty close. And then my under board connections are done. And then we have the bias circuit is going later down the line, you know, to feed the tube. So I've got that runner there and soldered on one side. So making progress. Call this phase two, I suppose. And I'm sure somebody probably would have preferred I sit those up rather than lay them down or 
something, you know, I'm sure there's opinions everywhere, but I kind of like the aesthetics of it, and these 2 watt resistors are highly unlikely to go bad. They're metal films, and I'm not too worried about them. Okay, so we'll call this business over here like phase three. And if we look here, there's some of these like C is labeled to go up there. So that's an under the board runner. Um, D actually goes to that tube socket, so I didn't hook that one up. But E um, goes way over there, so I did put that wire in place. Um, and then there's some under the board runners here. And there's one of them they drew as an over the board runner. So I did it as an over the board runner. Not necessarily, I mean, I could put it under the board, but I figured, you know, 50 years from now, if somebody looks at these diagrams, it'll just help them because it'll look closer to the picture. But there's a number of under the board runners, you know, that one must do here. And uh, I believe I have them correct. I've beeped them out with my meter. Now, when we start wiring controls, we're going to be putting some wires in the middle section here and quite a few along the top. So I just tack soldered a lot of this stuff because I'm going to be running wires off of it. Um, so if I see, you know, like a wire is going to come off of it in the future, I just soldered it enough to keep the component from falling out. If everything that, you know, goes in the hole is in the hole, then I've soldered it the rest of the way. Filled up the filled up the hole, so now I get to work on this end of the board. Okay, so I've added the rest of the stuff down to this end. Now there are some wires. If the wire goes off the board somewhere, it's not in there yet. But if it just goes to somewhere else on the board, I think I've got all those put in. Um, yeah, so there was a couple more of those, and I opted to put the studs in the bottom of the board because the one screw is kind of close to where that cap sits. Now the outside of that cap's insulated, I'm not worried about it. And then we come down here, and I could either try to elevate this stuff, which I, you know, I could, but I just opted to put the stud in and then put a piece of electrical tape over there. So I don't have to worry, even though this resistor and the capacitor lead and stuff aren't actually touching where the screw is. Um, you know, I just feel better as an insurance policy with a little piece of tape over it. So yeah, that's pretty cool. I think our, we're coming along okay. I guess now we have to start doing um, putting things in our chassis and putting tube sockets and the alike in there. Okay, so I have a chassis and I have a bag with tube sockets and nuts and bolts. So this is kind of self-explanatory. The octal sockets are going to have bear traps to hold the tube from falling out. And there's uh, cap shield caps for the 9-pin mini novels. And um, there's protective paper probably from the laser cutting widget so I need to uh, peel that off okay well that went okay I did the octal tubes so it's gonna be the rectifier and then four six v sixes go in there and then our 12 a axles are gonna go up here now the way the holes are drilled for these sockets um, the orientation is not going to be precisely like it is in the diagram. So we'll just have to count pins, but you know, that's what we do anyway. Um, I have to figure out, obviously the output transformer is going to go here, and the outputs for the speaker are going to be, what, maybe, maybe over here-ish. I have to look and double check. I think they and yeah, they're going to be like over here. And the impedance selector is going to be here, I think. I think that's right. So, the output ones would come here. 
and then maybe I don't know I'd have to either run the output down and over or I'd have to run the inputs for the output transformer over here I'm not sure which one to run through which holes and of course what's kind of funky is they just decided on the diagram to show them all ducked through one hole sort of we'll figure it out okay so I think that's how the transformers go on you got your power transformer and your output transformer and then your choke and they said to put the this is the bottom of the chassis like where the power cord and stuff goes um, so um, they said to uh, put the output side of the output transformer down and then the input side up and that's just what was recommended and then the choke goes over here so yep okay well that escalated quickly I decided to do the filaments so that's fine I used the red or not the red the black and the white wires there and since I've got a row of tubes down here, got four power tubes down here, and I've got a rail of them up there, and I've got the light bulb, trying to do them all in a string like Christmas lights didn't make a hill of beans worth of sense to me. Now, I'm sure somebody out there has a better idea. I mean, this is the internet where I'm always wrong. So I did the preamp tubes to the terminal strip. The light bulb is on the terminal strip, and the power tubes are attached to the terminal strip, and the green pair there off the transformer is going to the terminal strip. So, hooray for terminal strips. Hopefully, that works. Now, because I wanted to put the light on, then that means I have to put the plastic faceplate on. And then if I was going to do that, I'd have to attach it in more than one place so it didn't slide around. So I wanted to do like a potentiometer. And then if you're going to put a potentiometer on, then you have to put the brass plate under there. So, yeah, that escalated quickly. But, you know, it is what it is. And I think I'm going to call it for this evening and uh, proceed to do some more tomorrow. Well, I suppose I fast-forwarded on you. Sorry about that. Um... So after finishing the filaments, I did the tubes down here. Now it turns out for the bias pot, they didn't make a hole there. They drew it on the drawing right about there. Can we see that? Uh, yeah, it's on the drawing there. But um, there was no hole, so now there is. This is an aluminum chassis, so it wasn't so bad. And then I just proceeded to wire up the power tubes according to diagram. So we have our blue and our um, brown leads coming from the output transformer. And then we have the linkage of the plates there. We have a linkage, which I did in the dark blue. And then our plates are linked there. Our screens, our power, which is not yet hooked up, is going to come in. The screen power is going to come in on that red wire go through the big 1k resistor 1k resistors you know and it's just cherried right on down the line that's just power for the screens the grids go through the what is it 5.6k resistor 5.6 yeah 5.6k um, and of course we have two there going to one side of our phase inverter and then the other two are going to the other side of the phase inverter Yay! And uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of fussing. Oh, and then eight, uh, pin eight, which is the thick black wire. That's got to go to ground. So I've got those all chained up. And then ground, I put a grounding tab, right chair on the corner and a pin there. So I got something to solder to. I'm going to have to scoot this out of the way because I do have one more thing I got to ground there. Maybe I'll just put the wire in there now. Okay, kids, I took too long before I came back to see you. 
Um, the output transformer, obviously, we did the primary side, but the secondary or the output side, put that in, put the impedance selector switch in there, had to beep boop that out with the meter to figure out exactly how it worked. And I have it set up accordingly for the output transformer. It rides kind of close to that tube socket, so I'm glad I did all the tube socket wiring beforehand. And I put in the speaker jacks. These wires that are hanging over are the... Um, this is the power to the screens. And then... Oh, this red wire down here, that's the power to the output transformer, which will power the plates. And then these are the inputs to the two screens there after the phase inverter. Um, I've started wiring the preamp tubes. Did that one, which I believe that one's the inverter. Um, and I did that one. And then I realized that the input jacks are a snug fit up to there. So you're going to want to wire that tube up and you're going to want to kind of color code it the best you can so you remember what you did. Um, I did red for plates, yellow for grids or signals, and uh, blue for cathodes. And uh, so I think I'll be okay. So yeah, I'm making progress. The impedance selector switch in their picture is a little different than the one that I actually received. But this one wouldn't make any sense with the thing printed that way. But should be good now. I like I say I beeped it out to figure out what wires go where. Hi. Well it's another day. I don't remember where I was on filming this. But I've got the outputs obviously all good and I've got all the wires to the uh, front tubes and I've got the input sockets wired in and uh, they're actually connected because um, both of these via the 68k resistors um, do go to the first power tube or the first input tube there the 12ax so that's done um, can't really see it and then the presence switch um, that comes off of the output going up there and then it comes over it's going to go back to the board for the negative feedback loop my only fear that I have is by default if the amps negative feedback loop becomes a positive feedback loop you'd re normally you'd reverse these two wires but uh, getting to them is going to be tricky now because of all the additional things we've put in for the power supply because I've got the mains wired in and uh, stuff. So yeah, um, I think I thought of a workaround for that if it's a problem, but I don't know if it's a problem. And of course when our board goes in, our board is going to obscure our tubes up there just a little bit and so it was wise of me to put all the wires on those ahead of time and that was good our choke wires the first choke wires got to get to there and it's coming out from directly behind so I think that one wire I am gonna put on the back of the board and the rest of the stuff I'm gonna put on the front of the board okay so I've got the first two tubes lined up and well, they're kind of halfway covered by the edge of the board there, and that one between the jacks and everything else is almost covered, covered. A um, couple of ground wires. You got one here for the cathodes, ground up there, and there's another uh, ground wire right there that sneaks up. So, again, we're kind of working in a little bit of a confined space. I've got the first two volume pots hooked up, and again, all the wires to the first two preamp tubes. It seems like from about here over is tone stackish kind of stuff, and the tone stack, of course, is going to sit over here. So there's going to be a little bit of a distance run there. 
Um, that kind of stuff happens a lot of times where you, you know, compare the layout and diagram, which everything looks so beautifully linear, and then you get into the real thing and you find out you got to shuffle left and right, and, well, this doesn't quite line up with that, and, you know, it always looks better in a CAD drawing than it does in real life, but I think we're doing pretty good, and, uh, on these uh, tubes, again, with your wires, leave yourself some sort of color code so you can see, um, you know, I have a wire that is this color, therefore it's going to be on either, like for example, um, <clears throat> on the uh, on these tubes it was uh, pins uh, 1 and 6, yeah, 1 and 6 I would have done with red. So one and six would be red, and uh, two and eight would I I did in yellow, and then uh, or no wait no two and seven I'm sorry two and seven I did in yellow, and then uh, three and eight I did in blue, and that's uh, based on anode cathode grid, because these are triodes so they have anode cathode grill, grid and then the other three pins are just filaments, um, you know so that way um, if I can pick out you know, if I did both of the anodes in red, for example, I can figure out if the red is coming, you know, from the near side or the far side of the tube, and I don't have, you know, it just makes it easier to figure out which wire it is. Okay, so I finished hooking up the two volume pots there. That's the bright one, because it's got a bright cap jump in there. And uh, I got all three of the preamp tubes all wired up in there, and I think I did an okay job of not making a big, giant mess with the wires. Now, this granted feels to me a little Ampeg ish for any of you Ampeg fans or people who've watched me work on not necessarily the normal head cab but like a flip top where the transformers are on far opposite sides of each other and some of that is done for aesthetics. You feel like there's wires running all over the place. Um, but at least these wires are more colorful so I can uh, give them a little jimmy and you know see which one's which because we have multiple colors now um, but yeah you know we're making progress and obviously from here these <clears throat> these three points are gonna have to be boop over to this area and then obviously we have a lot more that are you know in this area and stuff like that that are gonna go up to the tone stack so yeah it's going okay it's going okay okay so I think I've got the tone stack wired up I tried to use a little bit of logic for colors because most of the tone stack stuff, you know, goes up in this area, um, kind of over here-ish. Um, <clears throat> I used the color coding. I did blue for base because B, and yellow for treble because it's the brightest of the three colors, and that leaves the red ones for the mids. So, um, you know, there's probably some kind of official unwritten amp builders color scheme but I do what I want to do because it's my amp and I can um, <clears throat> so now I have to do the master volume pot which is going to be going in like this little zone over here and of course I still haven't mounted it yet okay kids so I wired in the master volume pot there goes over there and then I finished up um, I had to put a ground there and over here, so I ground it up to the plate. Um, brought the high power DC lead from the rectifier tube up there, wired in the standby switch, it's the source for the output transformer, you know, the high voltage DC, choke goes there and there, screen voltage comes off of there, bias pot goes here bias voltage which is the blue with red stripe bias you know voltage lead off of there goes there and then the center tap for the uh, filament so the green yellow goes there and then I took the other wires that were unused and insulated and bound them and tucked them away um, had to connect the these are the where it goes to the output tubes that should be getting sound from all of this gubbins up here to all of that gubbins back there. So I think we're ready to kick the tires and light the fires and make sure it doesn't catch on fire and see if we have bias voltage and things so we'll start it up without any tubes. Okay so yeah nothing 
on fire or smoky. I'm putting about 50 volts into this amp. There are no tubes in it. And um, <clears throat> it's uh, lights glowing a little bit and I've got voltage. I've got like 16, close to 16 volts of bias voltage. The bias voltage adjuster thing does work and this is the maximum amount of negative voltage I can get here. So when we do go to put tubes in it, we're the least likely to red plate them. Cool. Okay, so <clears throat> I've added the rectifier tube and it's rectifier, well it's not a rectifier tube, it's a <clears throat> solid state replacement for a rectifier tube. It's uh, doing what it does. Um, seems to be okay. Um, obviously as I bring the voltage up, what was like 16 volts was 18, 20 volts, whatever, you know, it's climbing. But so is the B plus voltage. I've got several hundred volts of B plus back there. So I mean everything seems to be operating normally and there's no smoke, so I suppose I should get some tubes. Okay, so still nothing to report. I'm running on, um, I don't know, about 80 something or other volts on the wall. Um, Add the master volume turned to zero and the amp makes no sound at all, so that means the electrical business is good. I turn the master volume up to maximum and it makes a teeny bit of hiss. I got a rectifier tube now, no more solid state, and we've got our output tubes and of course the reason the two of them are taller is because they're plugged into my bias probe thing and obviously it's not pulling a lot of current. They're certainly running on low voltage and running diet, but that's okay. Um, and just for fun, I turned the master up to the maximum, and I turned the mass, the normal volume up to the pinnacle, and I get some hiss. And I turned the bright, and I get a bright hiss, and listening to the hiss, I did play with the tone stack, and all of that stuff works. So I think this is going to work right out of the gate. Um, I wouldn't imagine it wouldn't, but let's go get a cable and see if it makes buzzy sounds. Okay, so normal channel, the volume is up on just not zero, a little bit more, yeah that one's good, let's check the bright channel. Doing that one handed is a little trickier. The bright channel is a mighty bright channel to be letting float out there, but grounded it's fine. So yeah, that seems okay. And again we check the tone stack works, so I guess we need to bring the vo voltage up to normal and then bias our tubes. Okay. So, we're okay. These tubes are Russian um, six, it looks like six pi six C, but I believe we call them uh, six P six S. If you were looking them up, you could look up six P six S. And they're a little more, a uh, little bit, little bit more robust than a six V six, but they're essentially really close, and you can sw switch them out. And people have been switching them out for six V sixes routinely. Um, my findings are when I did the matching, when I put these on the tube matcher, this set was the one that I had four that matched, and it was also the high highest current drawing set that I had. Um, I had these things everywhere from a 6 to a 10 on drawing and I needed four that matched and of course I ended up with four 10s. So the bias has to be set as cold as this amp will allow me to without going back in there and fiddling with values. And it does get these in spec. They are biased kind of toasty but that's you know that's rock and roll for you. So I'm going to just let it ride and see how we do. And I think I can put some knobs on it and hook our speaker up in our cabinet and all that good stuff. Okay, <clears throat> well, I've had about five or ten minutes to play with this. 
and I've discovered that the two channels, the normal and the bright channel, are completely and totally different animals. They're not even close. Um, today's guitar of choice is a Rickenbacker, and um, uh, on the bright channel, I don't want to use the bridge pickup alone because it's really, really bright. But if I bring in the both pickups together, maybe roll the tone knobs back a little bit, um, it makes a very pleasing tone. You turn the bass up on the tone stack, turn the treble down a little bit, and uh, it's very clean, very happy, very nice, friendly, friendly, happy electric guitar. clean articulate tone um, the normal channel it has a lot a lot a lot of gain and the sound is very very meaty um, I find I'll turn down the turn down the bass on it uh, and uh, actually bring the master volume way up and bring the gain down if I want to get a clean ish tone out of it interesting so let's try a little normal channel this is I'm going to just be kind of a thick and fat sort of cleanish tone. tone stack settings but it produces something cool and then since you have a master volume you can just drive the tar out of it and make it roar okay so again still a acceptable listening volume for me anyway <laughs> This is definitely, this is cool. This would be a fun one for a gig because you can make it growl and the master volume actually works. And there's a lot of cool things one can do with this. I'm trying to keep the volume reasonable. I hope you can hear me talking. But um, if I turn the volume of the guitar down to next to zilch, the amp makes next to zilch of a sound. So... That's all that's all cable noise because I got the gain to the moon. But yeah, it turned out quiet. Um, everything turned out just fine. I'm happy with the way it turned out, but I'm not I'm not sure exactly how how I want to set it and how I want to work with it. But I'm intrigued because I like the meaty clean tone. I like the bright clean tone. They're very different. They're kind of weird to set. It feels sort of weird turning you know, a treble knob or a bass knob all the way to, you know, almost zero or almost maximum. But I, yeah, I'm happy. So, yeah, there you go. This is the amp that Ted calls Natalie. I'll give it my own name once I decide what I think about it. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.